It's pretty clear that from our perspective of a biblical family, uh, one man, one woman, that the uh, family is under severe attack in this nation, probably all over the world. But uh, clearly, the enemy is doing everything possible to try to cause problems in the family. And again, it should be pretty obvious because the family is the basis of society. It's, just, it's this what builds society. It's what really stabilizes everything. The church is nothing but a group of families. And so if the church has got the instrument to bring forth his kingdom, which is going to ultimately bring the demise of the enemy, then the enemy is going to do everything possible to do what? To destroy what it's going to overtake him. So he works on the family and especially works on the men because of the, the projection of the, the position, I'll say it that way, of men and how we do reflect our Heavenly Father. Now, we're not. He's a perfect Heavenly Father. But, but that, again, the representation, so the enemy does everything possible to try to knock out the man. We actually live in, it's what we refer to a fatherless generation. And now we're having fatherless generations, not just one, where the evidence of that, again, is seen throughout all of our cities and throughout, really, the way that we relate one to another. It's causing many, many problems. So, I want to talk about the role of the Father today. If you have your Bible, if you'll turn to Malachi. It's the last <clears throat> book of the Old Testament. Uh, the, between Malachi and Matthew is close to 400 years, 400 years of silence. Now, uh, it didn't mean they didn't exist. It's just that as far as having God speaking to us that we feel is the Lord's word, it's 400 years of silence. And so whatever he says at the end of that time period between the, where he talks again, uh, probably pretty important. Now, I'm just going to read the last two verses. Verse 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. That's pretty profound. I mean, when you think about it, the last thing that's recorded for us for nearly 400 years is an issue about fathers and sons and daughters' hearts being turned back to each other. And if it's done happen, then basically there's a curse. Now, big picture, let me just tell you this, uh, Elijah has come, and John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah, preparing the way for the Lord, and the day of the Lord, which was not only, it says it's a great day and a dreadful day of the Lord. Uh, that's Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. It's great if you receive him. But folks, it's dreadful if you don't. Yeah. So the same day, you got to understand it's already happened. This has already been fulfilled. Because Jesus, John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way for the Lord. The great day of the Lord has come. He was, he was brought forth and was raised up. And it is a great day for believers. But it is a dreadful day if you don't believe. So one day, it caused all kinds of issues. And so the reality is he has turned the hearts of the, of the children of the fathers back to the children and the children's heart to the father. See, the truth of the matter is he did that first. His heart was turned toward us in sending Jesus to the cross. And in doing so, he actually turned our hearts back to him. What Jesus did through the cross is that through his blood, he made peace with God. And we've been restored to a relationship that we could not have before. So really, this position is, is what this was prophesying about and saying this has happened. Now, the reality is we need to live that out, walk that out. Because the role of the Father and understanding the role of the Father is really important. Uh, primarily, the Father, I should say primarily, one of the things the Father does is that he helps us discover our true identity. So what a father's role is, and again, there's, the father is not more important than the, the mother. Uh, we need both. There, there's not an either or issue. They have different roles and different functions. But the father role is bringing forth identity, actually calls young boys into manhood and little girls into womanhood. Now, if that doesn't happen, there's extreme confusion. 
and, uh, and all the stuff that we're dealing with today, the gender identity of not knowing who they are and what I am and am I this or I'm that, is because, again, a fatherless generation, fathers don't know who they are. Hard to call somebody into something you don't know who you are. And so we've just got tremendous confusions going on. But the role of the father is to help identify and to call forth those gifts and call forth the reality of who God created them to be. Now, the father role also helps establish the values and a value system. So if they live by the Bible, they want to establish that with the children. But it's through that value system that brings stability into the family. Uh, father role is to bring, it's usually the protector and usually the provider. And again, it's not always, it's not just a stereotype, but the reality is that's sort of, the, that's the dynamics of the father role. It's extremely important. If the father heart doesn't go toward the children, I tell you, it makes it harder for the children's heart to go toward the father. Now again, like I said, in Christ, that's already been done. So we just need to come in alignment and agree with that. Uh, but if the father, and especially the father's heart, goes toward the children, it's easier for the children's heart to come this direction. Again, because it's an issue of, of order and priority in of God's order. Because when the parents function that way, it's easier for the children to. So that's why I say it's so important for us to understand the role of parents, and especially of the father. Now, let me... Uh, continue on talking about this, this whole issue of Father. How you see Father God really determines how you live. So your perception of Him, think about this in, in just your life for yourself, think about how, do you see Him as a healer? Do you see Him as your deliverer? Do you see Him as just your Savior? Do you see Him as, how do you see Him? And you know, do you think of Him as, well, sort of, you know, I don't know, you know, the reality is, is that how we see him does affect how we believe. It, it affects everything about us. We do project our earthly father's image onto our heavenly father. And so the first, again, our earthly fathers are not our heavenly father at all. But we do have a tendency, that's who's inputting us first and most. And so we have a tendency, good or bad, you know, we'll react one way or the other. We may react the negative way. You may have had a father that was an alcoholic or drank or had abuse in some area, and you may you go the other direction. Uh, and there are, you, you see all kinds of dynamics here. The point is, is that the best father is not our heavenly father. But your perception of that heavenly father will determine how you believe and how you have faith for things. And so it affects everything about it. Now, turn, if you will, to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, uh, beginning of verse 12, has three levels of growth. And these three levels of growth, number one, in verse 12, it says, and little, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you fathers because you've known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you've overcome the wicked one. I write to you children because you've known the father. I've written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I've written to you young men because you're strong and the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the wicked one. Now, my point in reading this is it seems to me there's three stages of growth in our spiritual walk. The little children stage first stage, I think represents being born again. Because what typically happens is you understand that your sins are forgiven, or at least we should. And we should understand that he forgave us completely a debt we couldn't pay, but that's sort of the, that's the beginning stage. When you get born again, you enter the kingdom, but you know your sins are forgiven. The next stage, the young man stage, and it says if you're strong and that you've overcome the wicked one, you're, you abide in the word, it says that you have overcome the wicked one. Uh, you're abiding in the word. To me, this is the stage of the Holy Spirit because you're never going to grow up until you've received and fully embraced the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that makes the word come alive. It causes you to be strong. It causes you to live in the power of the Spirit. I never knew there was a spiritual war going on until I received the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, I was like, whoa, 
there's a, there's a war here. But I also discovered Jesus already won the battle. He already won the complete war. Now, I get to get into it and be a part of it because of his victory. But I didn't even know there was something like that. The word of God came alive to me. It's by, again, by the Spirit when he comes upon you to release that. So I think it's the Holy Spirit stage that causes us to move into that fullness of, of the power of God and the anointing of God. But the last stage is the Father stage. It's desires that we grow up. We don't stay as children. We don't just stay there. We don't just stay in this middle stage. But then we grow up to become fathers. Because Paul said you have 10,000 instructors, but you don't have many fathers. Now, that's not just a gender deal, because we need mothers and fathers in the Lord. Why? Because that's what the, again, a representation of Heavenly Father. But what it is, it, we, we need that maturity to raise people up and to call people up into the fullness of who they are in God and who God is in them. I mean, it's so important for us to, to understand that the role of the Father, He has given to us everything, but then we get to represent Him. So it's so important for us to recognize this. I was in, in uh, yesterday in our praise and worship time for the men. Uh, I sat at the back, which I hardly ever get to sit at the back. So I was enjoying sitting at the back. And, uh, and, but I, was, I took my pad because I felt like God wanted to show me things. And I was sitting back there. I got a number of things during the worship time. But one of the things I got, the Lord said, uh, you have the wrong definition of maturity. And I said, okay. And I said, well, I'm not sure I follow it. I felt like the Lord said, you think maturity is in behavior and acting a certain way. You grow up, you start acting better. You stop doing things, you start doing other things. And I thought, mm-hmm. <laughs> he said, well, you got the wrong definition. He said, the definition of maturity is becoming like a child. That you just enjoy me. Delightful, delighted in him. I think sometimes we, we again, because, obviously for me, because we're Western culture, we still have so much of a performance. You know, I measure everything by how I do. And if I do really good, then okay, I'm doing better. Well, he measures it by how much do you love him? How much do you know his love? And a little child, I love the, I've been watching some of the golf, the U.S. Open, and I love those ads for Jason Day's little boy hits the golf ball and he runs to his dad and, and uh, just, I mean, he delights in his dad. That's how he wants for us. That's when you really know Father. You know that he's not angry. You know he's not upset. You know he's not sitting there going, I, you know, I'm waiting on you. I know you're going to mess up. I'm going to get you. No, none of that stuff. You just, you can't wait to run and jump in his arms knowing that he's given everything that he has for us, which he has. He gave himself. That amazing love he wants us to not only know about, but see what he's looking for is a people that will be consumed with that love and then we can give it away. That's what he wants. I mean, if, if the world is going to see Jesus and really see you know, what he was, Jesus was a representation of the Father. So what he, he was living in demonstration of the love of the Father and he wants us to go do the same thing. And so if the world is going to see that, we got to get immersed in his love. He wants us to grow up, know we're forgiven, be empowered by the Holy Spirit, but he wants us to grow up and know him so we can make him known. Now, we do project our earthly father's image onto our heavenly father. Uh, good or bad, we do have a tendency to do this. And I've talked about this before, talked about it in here, in Free Indeed. Every time we do this, we go through this because here's the point. I don't care what kind of father you had. He's not our heavenly father. And what I want to do is remove anything that we might have projected onto our Heavenly Father. Most of the time, we're not even aware of it. A lot of times, we, it causes us to have lenses that we see the world, but worse than that, we see Him through those lenses. And you, know, you would be, you would, most of the time, we're completely unaware of it. You never even think about that. Well, I don't. I wouldn't do that. So that's why I want to share this because I want God to expose any of those faulty lenses that we have that we're seen through that distorts our heavenly Father. Because anything at all is going to mess up our relationship with Him. The enemy is going to try to do everything possible to try to see Him incorrectly.
So here are some things. If your earthly father was harsh or legalistic, you have a tendency to believe that God is stern and, and is a discipline demanding. If your father was a perfectionist, then you'll think that God's hard to please. If there was little or no affection, you'll think the same thing, God's impersonal. Now, I got this from Jimmy Evans' book years ago, uh, Freedom from Your Past. And I mean, yeah, I can make hundreds of these things in comparison. But you understand what I'm saying. If, what if your, your father was a workaholic or not even there? Or will you think God's going to be pretty distant? That, that's the tendency that we have, even though we, we don't really believe that. But again, we have that tendency to project that. What if your earthly father was moody or temperamental? Well, you'll think that God is too. Uh, what if you were spoiled? Well, you expect God to spoil you. You know what I'm saying? It's just that tendency works in so many ways. What if you were compared to some of your, your siblings? You think that God has favorites. Uh, what, if you, what if your father broke promises? You think God's unreliable. You get the picture. I can go over many, many of those things, but here's what I want to do right now. And I'm not finished sharing, but I want, to, I want to stop right now and I want us to pray. Because what, again, I want to help us all remove anything that would keep us from really seeing Father as He really is. He is perfect. He is a good Father. As we sang, with this, he's more than that song, He is a good, good Father. He is a perfect Father. He has loved us with a perfect love and given to us everything that we need. And He is not like our earthly Father. And so I'm going to pray here that God, and I want you to pray. I want you to pray and say, Lord, show me if there's anything that, that has gone on it through projecting something onto you, expose it, Okay? And then the other thing we'll, we'll pray for, we'll, we need to forgive our earthly fathers. And I say this over and over again, you cannot give away what you don't have. And many of our earthly fathers were not fathered. And it's, you can't, <laughs> if you weren't fathered, it's going to be hard to give away something. And we need to forgive them for either what they did or what they didn't do. And we need to release them and bless them. And then what we want to do is that you may need to take your bulletin or, or maybe your iPad or your iPhone, whatever you got, and you may want to write down some of these things. If there are some issues that you've had with your earthly father I'm, I'm, and that you potentially have projected that onto your heavenly father, you want to renounce the lie that may be affecting your life that you think your heavenly father is going to be like that because he's not. Amen. Okay, let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you that you have loved us with such amazing love. Perfect love. You're perfect. And you're good. And you're, you said you're love. And love never fails. So I'm asking the Lord this morning to help us expose anything that we could have projected upon how we see you that is incorrect. Any concept, any precept, anything at all that has affected us from our natural fathers, that now we project upon you, that's obviously not you, we ask, Lord, that you would reveal it to us. Now just ask him, ask him if there's anything there. Could be very subtle, it could be very, very strong and blatant. Now Lord, we choose to forgive our earthly fathers. We forgive and bless them. We thank you for them, but Lord, we, uh, we forgive them for anything that they did or anything that they didn't do. And we just completely release them this morning and forgive them in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, I also ask you to expose any lie that we've believed because of projecting something on you. The lie that you're going to be like our earthly father, we ask you to forgive us expose any lie, all the lies. I pray, Lord, for all of us that you would, whether it's here or whether it's later, Lord, we want to, we just want to see you as you really are. So I'm asking, Lord, in the name of Jesus, give us a clear revelation of your nature, of who you really are. Well, Lord, we love you. And we're so thank you for the, the cross. 
We thank you that you've given to us everything that we need. Wow. We thank you that you first loved us. And we're so grateful and thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's one of the points. I just want to make this. If you don't know the love of the Father, you have a hard time really receiving much from him. So just like in the natural, if the children don't know you love them, they, they have a hard time receiving. But if they really know you love them, it's easier for them to receive, even correction or whatever it may be. But heavenly, the Heavenly Father loves us. He, is, he can't love us any more than going to the cross and dying for us. I mean, He has given Himself. He has given all that He's got. He's held back none. And He wants us to, to get under that spigot. You know what I'm saying? He wants, it, he wants the full download of that love. And once you get that love, it's easy for you then to move into that place of walking in obedience. And so if you're having difficulties in an area, you can need to go back and say, have I, done, have I projected something onto my Heavenly Father that would block me from receiving His love? Now, how do we get a better picture of him? Well, go, go with me to John 14. Again, this is, you got to see Jesus. That's the bottom line. Because he is the exact representation of the Father, it says in Colossians. He is the image of the invisible God. And so, uh, it's just, we've got to see him. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the, father, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And it's interesting to note that Father, or the term Father, is used over 100 times in the book of John. The Father is about 50 times mentioned in 14, 15, 16, and 17. Uh, I think that probably would give us a good clue that Jesus came to reveal the Father. And that's what verse 7 says. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him, have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and it's sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, I have, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you know at the time he says this, they're going, what? I mean, Jesus is saying, look, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What, what he's saying there is that God took on flesh. It says, and he dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of that of the only begotten Son. And so what they were seeing there was God in the flesh, and so they were seeing Father. Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father do, and I only say what I hear him say. I'm not here to do my own will. So he, he and the Father were one. And so he demonstrated the Father. So how do we see the Father? We got to go and read about Jesus. Spend time in the Gospels. Again, seeing what he did, how he did, why he did. Because that was the exact representation of the Father. So we need to replace faulty perceptions with the true perceptions of who he really is. And that's how you do that. You've got to go back to the truth of God's Word. Now, one story... Uh, in the Bible that I love is Luke chapter 15. And then we'll, I'll close with this. Luke 15 is a story of the prodigal son. What is, my Bible is what it's called. The parable of the lost son. Verse 11 of chapter 15 says, He said, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood, and not many days after the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Now, let me just make comments as we walk along here. Uh, this story that Jesus tells is, is like way out there. This would never happen. No father would give his inheritance to the child for him to go and blow it. Uh, in that culture especially, it's not happening. For, uh, he, he emphasized, it makes it a big deal because he's saying, look, he, not only did he take his possessions, but he left not only his father, but he left his land. So what he's basically saying there, he, he has, I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want anything to do with your religion. I don't want anything to do with anything that has anything to do with you. I'm out of here. Okay? So, I mean, it's, a, it's making a, a major point here. 
Uh, I mean, this is, this is huge. This is not like, hey, you've gone on a little trip here. No, he is making a huge statement. Verse 14 says, When he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land. He began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. He would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that he the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's ser hired servants have, been, have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And this is a true orphan. And a lot of us live like orphans. And we've been like this. We've wandered off and drifted away from God. And we have the same attitude. I'm basically, I'm unworthy. You know, I'm, I, I'll do anything, but I'm unworthy to come back to the Father. So verse 21 says, the son said, uh, I'm sorry, verse 20 says that he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Isn't that amazing? What an amazing story. Son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father said to the servants, Bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatty calf and kill it. Let's eat and be merry. Now, is that amazing? I mean, here's the son. He comes up to him and he says, okay, I've blown it. I've messed up. You know, I am not even worthy because your son anymore. I, I mean, I, I would just be one of your hired servants. So what does the father do? He turns around and says, hey, get him the robe, get him a ring, put sandals on him, get out the calf, we're going to have a party. I mean, he didn't even he didn't even respond to it. You do understand this is a picture. This story is about the father. It's not about the prodigal. This is our father. Regardless of where you've been, regardless of what you've done, regardless of what's happened in your life, he didn't bring it up because of the blood of Jesus. And it's what's really amazing is he wants to. I mean, he, there is no, you know, like okay. You're going to have to have a little period here. We're going to see if, if you really are changed. You know what I'm saying? That's how we think. I'm telling you, we think we got to pay penance to do something. I need to do something, you know, because, I mean, there's no way. That ring meant that he could represent the Father immediately. The robe meant that he was brought back into the full graces of the family and the sandals. I mean, it was no pro probationary period. There was no time. We'll see how you do. We'll check you next year. Isn't that amazing? Amazing story. Because it's the amazing story of the father. He didn't even, he didn't have any comment. He didn't say, man, I told you so. I'm, nobody would ever say that around here. But anyway, <laughs> just in case, that would pop out from somewhere. <laughs> you know, I mean, I just think about having my own son, if that had happened, you know, and to bring, it, 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 seriously, bring back, say, okay, just go, go right back into business or right back into whatever we're doing. I mean, wow. Well, the story's not over there. So they're having this party, because he said, verse 25, uh, now his older son was in the field. He came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked him, what, what does this mean? And he said to him, your brother has come, and because, he has received, um, because he's received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatty calf. Well, he was angry. He wouldn't go in. The father, father came out to plead with him. So he answered and said to the father, Lo, I've been with you these many years serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you've never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as the son of yours came, who devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatty calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. Isn't that amazing? Now, the reality is that both sons are orphans. And that's just exactly how we can be, too. You know, we could be the one that ran off and squandered everything and living in all kinds of manner. But listen, you can be an orphan sitting in church every Sunday because you're over here trying to please God. I, I, I'm going to do everything. I'm serving you. I've been doing everything just for you. Let me just tell you, neither one of those work. The father looks at that one that's serving 
And he loves the same as he loves the one that's run off because the Father is perfect love. There's nothing that you can do to make him any more happy with you. Not acting perfect or acting bad. Neither one of those. You know, not, his love is perfect. He's a perfect father. And what is amazing, he says, look, to this one, he says, everything I've had is always yours. It's all yours. It's always been yours. Quit trying to gain it by doing works. Quit trying to be good when you can just be righteous and receive the whole thing. It's amazing, this story, because it's the story of the father. It's the story of a father that's perfect. Our father is perfect. He has done everything. He's given to us everything. Now, one last thing, Hebrews 4, 16. You might write this down and look at it. I didn't even, I don't think we put it up there. It says that we can come boldly to the throne of grace to receive grace and mercy in time of need, to obtain mercy and grace in time of need. And that's how we can come all the time. And it has nothing to do with our works, our merit, our effort. It has to do with only one way that you can come before Father, that's through Jesus Christ the Son and through the blood of the cross. The only thing that qualifies us to go into the throne of grace is Jesus. Not your work, not your effort, not your lack of effort or energy. It's only because of the blood of Jesus. It's the only way that we can come there. But when we get there, we get to obtain mercy and find grace. Now, why those are really important is because grace is not getting what you deserve. Okay? Now, James Ryle shared it's the power of God, but to think about it, it's not getting what you deserve. What we deserve was death. But by grace, we've been saved. We don't have to experience that. But mercy is getting what you don't deserve, the favor of God and the blessing of God. We get both. Isn't that amazing? That's because our Father is a perfect Father, and He's a good Father. Now, I pray that we can be a people that will continue to grow. That's really our, our heart's desire. Let's keep moving. Let's, let's see, Lord, help us expose those things that would keep us from growing, from really seeing him as he, as he really is. He's a perfect father. And I just pray that God would give us that revelation of that, that we live that out every day. Amen? Okay. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, listen, I can't imagine not wanting to know Jesus. You know, if you've never really understood or somebody has hurt you or a church has hurt you or something, but listen, we need a revelation of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And he is the perfect representation of the Father, but he forgave us a debt that we couldn't pay. So if you're here and you don't know for sure if you know Jesus, we want to we pray with you. Come up here to the front at the end. And also, you could be here. You've never really been baptized in the Holy Spirit. You need the power of God to overcome the enemy. You need the power of God to, to live in the word and to know the, um, it really how to live and how to walk through it, how to grow up. And if you never become a father, we're gonna pray that God will help us to grow up and really be like a child and delight in him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you and we bless you. And we thank you that you've called us into a relationship with you. And we're so grateful and thankful that you forgave us of our sin, of a debt that we couldn't pay. You've sent your Holy Spirit to empower us, to cause us to live victoriously, overcoming the enemy and all the junk that the enemy tries to bring in our life. And you've, and you've called us into relationship with you, Father, to cause us to grow up so that we can become fathers and mothers and help others grow up also. So I pray for everyone here today. I pray, Lord, that everyone would hear this message, that you'd help us to be fathers and mothers in the Lord. Help us to see you as you really are, a phenomenal, loving, heavenly Father who you loved us while we were still sinners. You loved us before that we could ever even had any idea of trying to live for you and walk in your truth. And now, Lord, you said there's nothing that can separate us from your love. So I just pray, Lord, a continued revelation of your love for each and every one of us. Wow. 
Father, we love you. We bless you. We just thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. God is so good. He is a perfect father. Amen. Well, let me bless you. Father, I pray blessings upon everyone here today. I pray, Lord, you would guide us and direct us and help us, keep us, protect us, and use us to represent you in a way that brings forth your kingdom. Lord, I just speak blessings of health and prosperity over everybody here in Jesus' name. Amen.